All right, guys, for one last time, uh, for the time being, it's time to dip into Marvel TV, uh, as we have been for the last few weeks, for our sins. Um, I don't know if it's turned out exactly the way we envisioned when we started doing this, but uh, we've had fun having weekly conversations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm being joined by the one, the only, and look, wait, I think, I think with the last one, I might have this. Okay, let's give this okay. a try. Dan, 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 Dan. Dan, Dan, line on. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Finally, finally. Okay, did it live. Last episode. <laughs> yeah, no, there we go. Well, look, we'll use it for future. This isn't the last time we'll be talking about Marvel by any means. So, look, we have it. We have it in the lock or whatever we want. Um, Dan, I understand, obviously, you know, a, a big week for you. Obviously, we, spent, we mentioned last week, happy birthday. Um, And you're just back off the plane from London. And, and kind of we'll be checking in on kind of some of the stuff you've been reading as well as discussing it uh, in our episode discussions. Did you pick up anything interesting while you were over there? Or I did. Uh, I checked out from Planet International on, uh, in London, which was decent. But, like, it's mainly just a big pop culture store now. But I checked out one of my favourites. Comic shops over in London, which is Gosh Comics, highly recommend. Go straight downstairs to the back issue section because they do a lot of indie stuff up top, which might not be everyone's taste, but their back issue section is fantastic. And then Mega City Comics in Camden Market, which was brilliant. Uh, my favorite comic book franchise of all time is Lady Death, which is not the Lady Death from the Marvel Universe. She doesn't exist there. It's just death. Yeah. Can people please start getting that right? But um, I dropped uh, about 100 quid on some Lady Death back issues and I got some key issues I've been trying to fill in. But uh, the main thing I got, which was actually part of my birthday present, I sold a comic when I was 12 that I absolutely loved for a bunch of other comics I traded them in. And my partner, Kelly, got me one of the ones I was missing, which is one of my favorite comics of all time. Been looking for this for over 20 years. And now it's back in my collection. So that was awesome. Uh, uh, just for anyone listening at home, just call out what, what it is. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that was uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 346. This is like one of the kind of key Venom issues. Nice. It sets up an amazing fight between Spider-Man and Venom in episode, in uh, issue 347. Unreal. Which they fight on an abandoned, uh, like, I think it was a nuclear testing island. Artwork in those old comics was just absolutely amazing. It was uh, Jim Jensen, is it? or no, sorry, Eric Larson was the artist on that. Absolutely excellent work, really good storytelling stuff. Uh, been on a Spider Man kind of crazy kick recently, been back reading Maximum Carnage, which is nice. just a whole heap of fun. And recently, I have been reading the newest issue of Lady Death, which uh, is just absolutely fantastic. I'm very biased because my favorite comic of all time, like I said, but uh, I came back with a suitcase of, of stuff. <laughs> uh, it was a very profitable visit, yeah. Nice, nice. I look at some great recommendations there as well. Like, obviously, for, for places to check out in London, we were saying, like, oh, I'm heading over there next month, uh, going to mm-hmm. Wembley for All Out. A lot of we're all in. A lot of people probably listening will be in the same boat. So, uh, great recommendations. Thanks for that. Uh, guys, we're going to discuss um, Secret Invasion, last episode, the entire series. And, guys, this is you're going into the spoiler verse here. So, you are not in a safe, spoiler free zone. We are going to talk about everything from Secret Invasion. If it's happened in there, we're going to discuss it it's up for discussion same with all of the marvel uh cinematic universe same way we're going to be discussing comics as well though with comics in particular with the kind of background lore we're not designing it to kind of ruin plots for you or anything like that or let you know kind of what you might expect in the future we want you still to be able to read them in peace but we will kind of give you context and stuff that might aid your kind of viewing experience and so on and so forth so if you haven't watched the episode um make sure you go away watch it and then come back to us but in the meantime what we're going to do is we are going to before we get into our discussion recap the episode as we always do with our final old recap for season six uh, uh, for secret invasion season uh, one episode six home and fury calls priscilla who's packing up and getting out of dodge a week after everyone told her to and the inevitable attack on here on her already happened she doesn't fear gravik's wrath but she does fear a massive cleanup and i relate to that to be honest apparently uh, fury says goodbye or as it's known in terms of story guarantees the audience that he's surviving in case uh having him all over the marvel trailer last week wasn't enough of an indication at uh, the worst presidential security operation since lincoln's night on the town continues 
continues as Scrody and like four Secret Service agents guarding the president after a hit on his life are convinced to move by one phone call from Sonia Fallsworth saying that Fury, by the way, the guy who was there just last week but casually left, was on his way. So now it upends everything, whereas last week they were pretty fine with it. However, we do see Fury confronting Gravik, who's now alone in New Skrullis. The two have an ideological debate that turns out to be completely pointless when we realize what's actually going on before Gravik charges up the old harvest. Shock and fucking horror. It turns out to be Skrullisi, and they have a big superhero battle, mashing up the different MCU powers now in their possession, like playing toys with your annoying little brother who's like I'm the Hulk but then I start to fly and shoot lasers out of my eyes 12 year old you is like that's not realistic but 50 year old Kevin Feige is like no nah, that's deadly go for it guys whatever you want to do go for it I'm in uh, turns out after 6 weeks of shape shifting espionage and international politics the solution was right there all along why don't they just kill the evil scrolls? <laughs> Who would have thought about it? That's what Fury does to Scrody when he shows up in the hospital and Skrullisi does the graphic there by actually becoming the actual Skrullisi after feeding the human, uh, freeing the human prisoners. Ritson goes on TV and declares war on all alien life on Earth and New Asgard are just chilling in Norway like uh, sound lads. Uh, Fallsworth recruits Skrullisi for a bit of covert mutually beneficial support during the impending war and somehow this entire shit show leaves Fury thinking well my work here is done and he's back off to space but not before Priscilla joins him to assist with peace talks uh, with the Kree. They kiss, her, they kiss with her wearing her real face and Fury pulls a total Ken move taking off her glasses of being like I never noticed how beautiful you were uh, there's no post credit scene because someone in Marvel thought that all of that was enough so that ladies and gentlemen once and for all was Secret Invasion Dan your thoughts on not only the last episode but now we actually get to properly frame the series and how the last episode kind of fits in did it did it did it land the plane did it save the day or, or kind of where you feel how you feeling about the series and the episode in total Immediately after watching the episode, my first thoughts, which have changed, were who's writing this shit? <laughs> um, and uh, whoever that intern is, he should not uh, pass whatever like trial they're putting him through because, like, just no. I was like, it wasn't even that I was disappointed. It was, you know, when you kind of watch a show, when you have that look on your face, like someone just farted in your general direction. It's like, it's not disappointment it's just like what is actually going on and that's kind of how it felt i was watching it after checking out some of the stuff again just going to fast forward back through through it there was a few things now that i'm wondering if it's going to take take us in a certain direction okay. we really went down to speculation rabbit hole over the last couple of weeks coming up with some absolutely harebrained concepts which i really enjoyed never thought we'd see any of them and then marvel were just like yep yeah, you're not seeing any of them yeah. And I just felt that it, a lot of the stuff, like the, the main kind of points of the story were a little bit lazy. And then the kind of sub parts were just straight up stupid. There was a lot of things that just didn't make sense. And I just, one thing I brought up to you last week, which was when the president's incapacitated, which they've done in like, you know, I think they did in West Wing, they did in House of Cards, shows over the years, 24, the vice president kicks in. Here is an awesome opportunity. Maybe they couldn't pay Harrison Ford, but they could have had something in the background. Uh, the president was just an idiot. Like an absolute moron. Like you brought up there in your recap how he just wasn't being guarded and how he's so pliable. But that scene in, in the hotel hallway, it's like, I don't know what to do. It is literally your job in these situations to know exactly what to do. And then to like, okay, like this, this, effective socially encouraged genocide it's like okay junior mussolini whatever you think <laughs> i just said where what is happening what is this crap this is shit comic book levels of lois lane living the life of a black woman for a day batman shooting dark side at the end of final crisis or norman osborne banging gwen stacy <laughs> why did you just do these things you should learn from your mistakes don't do this um but as we're probably going to get into Thinking back at it now, just a few little things I can kind of see. I think this is major filler, and we're not going to feel the effect of secret invasion until we get past a few more things that we know are coming out. 
Okay. Okay. Interesting. And look, I, I love that. I love the optimism because you're like, this was shite, but maybe someday we'll think it's good. <laughs> I love it. You're, 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 you're holding, and, and I appreciate that. And I, and I really want to take some that's of that possibility. I'm a lifelong comic book fan. Yeah, that's fair. It might be good in the future. Yeah, in 20 years, I might mildly appreciate it. Um, For me, this finale was emblematic of a bigger concern that I have with Marvel TV. And that problem is, I'm not sure they know how to do TV. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're now yep. in our ninth attempt at this. And while there are some hits and misses, they're generally at the whim, the hits of whoever is steering the ship because they got a person in who knows how to do TV. But when it comes time to bring it all together into the bigger picture, I don't feel they know how to do that. And that's a foggy problem. And this, like pretty much every Marvel TV finale they've had, except for Loki and She-Hulk, was basically just a mini version of the last 45 minutes of a Marvel movie. And this one in particular was a pretty poor, cheap example of that, that looked yeah. like they were, they were, it was at the level of the shitty AI-induced uh, opening credits. Like, that's how some of the VFX were. And again, not throwing shade at the VFX artists. They're severely underworked and underpaid and under-resourced by Marvel. Um, but it just it, it's just the reality of the situation. We watch and consume these shows like we're supposed to with TV, hoping that in the end, the kind of individual strands that we care about are all going to pay off and going to jump off somewhere and lead us into like kind of, if it's not the next series, it'll be the next project because that's what we get with Marvel. Everything is all kind of connected um, and then kind of setting up a teaser for what's to come. And every single time, we're left disappointed because Marvel aren't adapting their stories to the medium itself. We've said many times throughout this, and again, I continue to say it, this, when you take it as just a story and you forget about the fact that we had to sit through six weeks where, like, what it started off as one hour and it kind of got shorter and shorter as the weeks went on, yeah. but episodes every single week, it isn't actually an awful story, but it's the TV side that almost makes it insufferable. It's the fact that they're trying to give us weekly cliffhangers and they're trying to encourage us to theorize, uh, but we're miles ahead of them at every stage because we know exactly what's coming up. I'm pretty sure that we guessed everything that happened in this finale two to three weeks ago. If this was like a two-hour movie where we're all watching it in one go and we don't have time to take breaks and think about it and theorize, we'd probably enjoy it a lot more, but now they're just stretching it out. And when it comes to to kind of put it back together in the end it just feels rushed then somehow um so it's kind of the worst of both worlds and again not an awful story but just again it's just i don't think they know how to do television that's really concerning because it's a big part of their plan and even if it's a case of they don't know what to do then i'm sorry i know he's like helmed one of the biggest hollywood success stories of all time but it's Kevin Feige who's got to go, hey, maybe it's me. I'm the problem. And just step back, give it to, like, bring in a TV maestro, bring in an absolute whiz, run the ship, go, I want you to do this, 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 give them bullet points of what they need to achieve off that, and then let them work. Let them build a TV show because it feels at times like Feige is in the room trying to pull all the strings together, trying to make sure it's consistent with everything in Marvel. And it's just coming across as cheap Marvel and cheap versions of what we've seen in the past. And it's really harming the brand. Again, this isn't awful, but it's harming the brand because it's not good. And Marvel now just doesn't have that stamp of quality with their, with their on-screen products that they used to. And it's a real shame. Um, yeah. Let's dive into some of the individual scenes. So one thing that Kevin Feige specifically promised us in the media over the past few weeks is we're going to find out when the switch up with Scrody happened. We did not. <laughs> did nothing. Nothing. We, we won't give a definitive proof, but we can theorize, uh, okay. which has the biggest implication. The biggest thing that, that comes out of uh, a secret invasion is uh, the whole Brody thing. Hmm. So, Everyone that they freed at the end of the episode was obviously wearing the clothes they were wearing when they were abducted. Okay. Uh, James Rhodes was wearing a hospital gown, which unfortunately proves that a fan theory that everyone's been exercising over the last couple of weeks has all but been confirmed, which is the last time we saw Rhodey in this gown was the end of Civil War. Yeah. So everything that's happened from Civil War up to now, Rhodey coming out of that, like, scroll induced coma is he's not aware of sorry mate your best friend's dead all your other mates disappeared for five yes. years and uh there's like we we touched on as well but some of the stuff that guy has said as well 
but mainly the stuff that Rhodey said during Falcon Winter Soldier is that there's a serious implication, you know, there's there's a, a cultural significance to uh, the fact that Rhodey's been such a proud African American character that he was he really motivated Sam Wilson. He's always been the kind of wiser man when it comes to that sort of thing. And that kind of feels cheap and stuff as well, mm. because it was just someone essentially saying stuff that they think that an African American in Rhodey's position would say, which really hurts the kind yeah, of Yeah, that's oh, that's really bad. But that like by retconning this, which I'm ass- I'm I'm assuming it's a retcon that this yeah. wasn't the original concept the whole time. I don't think at the end of Civil War they're like, by the way, this is the last time we're going to see James Rhodes and he's going to be a scroll from here on out. I, I don't think any executive said that. So it, there's there's massive implications there, but the journey Rhodey goes through, knowing that Ironheart and Armor Wars are around the corner, which in the original comics James Rhodes he had just made his debut as the second Iron Man. And then became War Machine. That's the thing. James Rhodes was actually Iron Man for a significant amount of time in the comics. Um. So what are we going to see here now with going into Armor Wars? Are they going to take a lot from the comics? And could this be Rhodey coming to terms with a lot of the shit that we assumed he dealt with, but is completely oblivious to? Mm. So that's a big, that's an interesting takeaway. Yeah, like again, you're making me more positive than I feel the show is actually like you're doing better work than than Marvel did. <laughs> it actually making me more positive. There you I've go, guys. Experience on TV. I've booked a few good matches. <laughs> I can put words together for you. Don't be worried. Like WrestleMania 17 look like <laughs> I don't know WrestleMania nine. He, he's available, guys. Uh, give give him a call. Um. Yeah, and and I don't hate that. Like, there is an opportunity for them to make me okay with all of that then, if that's the case. Because then a lot of the character, like, aspect of Secret War, like, yeah, that'll be a case of, yeah, okay, I'm I'm okay with that. I, I could be okay with that in a certain world. Like, again, that the old chestnut of maybe it'll be good in the future. So maybe... If, it, it could be okay because that actually gives him an arc to go on a journey to go on. Whereas I'm not very interested as a, as a character. Um, like if it was just him, uh, like a, a boy himself, like as a leading role, he does play better second. Um, let's talk about Gaia and Gravik. We did see their, their yeah. super skull bat- battle. Obviously we put a lot of faith in this and kind of hoped that it was um great. I, I kind of want to ask, from two standpoints, first and foremost, I want to kind of look at uh, what you thought of it and how we're impressed where you by the presentation of uh, them battling using all of these kind of combined MCU powers. But also I want to get a, a touch on kind of your thoughts on their strategies. Like, is that how you'd use those powers if you had them? Or do you feel there was there was a bit of nitpicking you did? Like, what were your thoughts on like how they use the powers? No, Okay, so the fight scene at the end was, it was too little. I'm not gonna. I'm not too little, too late because that's when it should have happened. But it just, it felt like. I mean, I do enjoy a good bit of fan service, but that just felt like. Look, do you remember this character? Do you remember this character? They have all those powers. Uh, it could have been done with a bit more subtlety. Like I said, I've always been a big choreography mark. I really do love, you know, good storytelling through the medium of cinematic combat. And there's a lot of fight scenes that are very underrated that when you really look at what they're trying to do, you see the genius behind them. In this, they had a great opportunity to do a very, very simple tried and tested mechanic that they use in Hong Kong cinema mainly, whereas you see someone learning a lot about their power as the Mm -hmm. fight goes on. Great example of that is Jackie Chan in uh, Drunken Master, which is one of his big breakout ones. You can see him developing his style during his Bruce Lee and Way of the Dragon as well. Fantastic fight scenes. They're learning as they fight. Suddenly you're in bar- you're inundated with all of these new powers, and we've seen like the a clip of like some of the names that they would have inherited the powers of some of them that don't make sense. But I'm sure we'll get into that. You, we've seen like mainly the Groot power and the extremist power being used by Gravik. So why, as the fight didn't go on, did they didn't they learn more? It seems like they were well aware of everything that they had at their disposal now, which maybe you could argue is like a scroll trait. It's part of their ability to shapeshift. They have a just higher understanding than we can contemplate, but that's really trying to look for a check mark that validates what they're doing. I would have liked to see 
a little bit of development as the fight scene went on. Like, Gravik goes to punch Gaia with Obsidian Maw's fist, and that's blocked by Hulk's fist. Then they tried something like that again, but the, the, the defensive one isn't as powerful, and they have to shift their tact. The only example I've seen in this was when Gravik's taken a more uh like straight line true like he was very uh powerful and he was going for obsidian maw and hulk and abominations powers and then what really won it in the end what what really turned the fight around was gaia using mantis's power which is one of the more docile peaceful cerebral powers which won her to fight but we could have seen so much more than that and i think it could have really given a good fight scene because okay you've got a budget to consider and everything but you've got so much to play with. Like, you're really dipping into a five-year-old kid with his action figures for the first time, like you said, and they make the story as they go, but you actually have a reason for that logic to exist in that, and they drop the ball. You're muted. Apologies. Uh, another thing that I, I kind of don't think they've even realized, uh, maybe they do, maybe there's a plan here, but it didn't seem that way. And it's kind of unforgivable because you broke down earlier in the season really well how a lot of the super skull powers mirrored the super skull powers of the Fantastic Four in the comics and it all tied in together. And that made sense. And everyone was happy with that. That's all we've ever known. Nobody, not a single person on the planet was asking or expecting them to add the harvest idea to at the table of having all the powers all mixed up in one. That's a show original and that's something that they've brought to the table. Now, as a result of this, have they made Gaia the strongest force in the universe? She essentially is Captain Marvel mixed with Thanos and has all of the different MCU powers all mixed up into one, but they don't seem to have reckoned with that at all. Like, Fury didn't even think to mention, oh, BT dubs, if you're going to war with the Skrulls, you have someone who's essentially all of the Avengers in one leading them. You might want to think about that. Like, if Fury... And Fury doesn't want Ritson to go ahead with this war. That seems like a pretty big card to drop. Um... Do, do you think she realizes she's the strongest hero? Like, do you think she wants to be like, what is going on here? Is Guy the strongest hero or is there something that I'm missing here where all of the powers somehow dilute each other? Because I don't think the show explained any of that. I think they just made Guy essentially mm -hmm. Captain Marvel mixed with Thanos and none of us were ready for it. None of us wanted it, but it's happened and it's here. And now I think yeah. it's something that they have to do something with. If you take it at face value, yes, she is. She's now like one of the most powerful entities, ignoring obviously the celestials and then the cosmic powers that we've been introduced to briefly. Um yeah. I th I think like arguably face value now Gaia is one of the most powerful entities in the MCU, which is like just not a good idea. Um they could have uh, combat that very simply once again a lot of missed opportunities here by once the fight with Gravix was done why didn't she just like collapse or have her powers you know show that like she's she really depletes herself by that and that's just a quick right it falls to her knees falls on the ground maybe is really wincing for breath or something that it takes a lot out of her but we didn't see that we saw her doing the superhero pose and I'm going to use all my newfound powers to make my eyes glow because it's cool looking you know, so obviously that doesn't exist, but the dilution thing was one thing I thought about, like you just said there, maybe by using some of the powers, that's it. Or one thing they've done in the past, which is a cop-out, is that she's going to have to keep going back to the Harvest DNA to replenish her powers. Once again, we haven't seen this in speculation, but could this power-up be a transitional? Could it be time-based? Could it be exertion-based? If she keeps using her powers... Will she get weaker and weaker? And that'll take a sentence in another show to explain. But, uh, I mean, Fallsworth did obviously come up and like she, it looks like she wants her to lead the scrolls. But, I mean, the Thunderbolts is a very original idea when it first came out. A bunch of bad guys posing as superheroes. And it's don't, if you don't, if you're not familiar with Thunderbolts, uh, comic book it wasn't like what you're probably expecting there with that description being something like the suicide squad and the suicide squad being actual bad guys who were sent in for near impossible missions the thunderbolts posed the superheroes 
after I think it was the onslaught story, so there was very few superheroes left in the MCU at the time. But they were actually bad guys who just donned different outfits, and it was almost like a big con. So it's not similar to kind of that. But we don't like the Thunderbolts were the bad guys and the good guys in their own comic book. But I don't think that's going to translate to the TV show. So with Fallsworth recruiting Gaia, could we see Gaia in the Thunderbolts as possibly a don't want to say a bad guy, but maybe a morally great character that they could fight because you've got now a very, very cheap way, but could be fun way of the Thunderbolts fighting the Avengers in the Thunderbolts v. Gaia. Hmm. Interesting. And and I think, to be honest, I think Thunderbolts is another one that, like this show, we're almost going to have to temper our expectations with it because I think there is the, they could absolutely go there. And the story, like this show, and like everyone said to Fury, so many occasions where it's like, Call the Avengers, call the Avengers, call the mm. Avengers. The Thunderbolts is going to be a series where it's going to be logical to be like, why don't we just call the fucking Avengers? <laughs> but I think budget is going to dictate that they're going to have yep. to make it self-contained. So yeah, you do need characters that are in there that essentially are going to turn this into a civil war type situation. We already know Bucky's going to be there. There's a strong likelihood that he's one of those. And we know that, uh, you know, Gaia being there is a, is a great shout as well. I think that's, you, you probably hit the nail on the head there. Um, In terms of the ending, we said for the past few weeks, we did call that, look, for all the theorizing that we had, that we're going to keep it self-contained and we're dead right as far as that goes. But we did say that we didn't want it to just end here. We wanted it to be kind of messy. We didn't want to just go guys to win. Everyone's happy and blah, blah. We have somewhat messiness. Like there's this kind of vigilante justice beginning on the scrolls. You have Fallsworth and, and, and Gaia going off. And we kind of, again, have theorized about where that could go. Um, But one thing I think we took for granted the entire time was that there'd be at least one post credit scene which would point us in some direction towards the future and there was absolutely nothing and it was almost like insecure because I think it was record time as soon as the credits came on that the Captain Marvel thing came up because it was just like look there's no post credit scene they were just like straight away they were like no this is it um, because they probably knew we'd be waiting for it but what do you think about this ending and the fact that they left out and omitted a post credit scene and just hunted on the opportunity to kind of lead into something else we've got the, we've got like literally sam jackson we know from the trailer last week he's going directly to the marvels from this like how did they not tie that together that was stupid they should have they could have kept that uh out of the trailer just to kind of like fish hook us along a bit more because then once we seen that i was like right i didn't want him to die the whole time i had a feeling he wasn't going to so i was like happy about that but it was ruined by the marvels trailer um it's another interesting thing, a fan theory that I've actually seen just being brought up not that long ago, which is, once again, it's like our speculation with the X-Men saving the day last week. It's not happening. But let's just go down the rabbit hole for a second. So we know the Marvels is going to be the next big thing. And the whole idea is that we got Kamala, Photon, and Captain Marvel all tethered together mm. in this exchange of powers, which is probably going to like you know bring their powers a bit more along a baseline which could eliminate the need for like, you know, just Carol Danvers being so overpowered that she is right now. Hmm. But could Gaia, now that she has Captain Marvel's powers, be brought into this thing? Like, could she be Ooh. the Fort Marvel? Because we can see, like, when they use her powers, they seem to exchange places. What happens if that was to become an element? Now, nothing in the trailer relating to that, and we're really, like, speculation. The logic's there. It's a, it's a fun theory to explore, but that could tie in. Mm. I don't think so. But once again, it's it's nice to kind of think there and leave, leave it open. Regarding the post credit scene, the the Sonya Fallsworth scene where she where she brought Gaia to that it, it it reminded me because of the texture of like a, a giant hive, like a giant beehive where they're like. But I don't know. Like no one seems to know what was actually going on in that scene. But why wasn't that the post credit scene? Yes, I know. Post credit scenes are supposed to be confusing. That's the whole thing. I remember still the biggest post credit scene. I still think was at the end of the first Avengers movie, and I remember seeing that in the cinema and like being so excited for that film. And at, at, when everyone stayed back for the post credit scene, you hear everyone like, "Who's that? Who's that purple guy? Who's he?" And then I heard like a guy a few rows back, oh, that's Dark Side. Uh, that means Batman's gonna be in this soon. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, 
looks like you fucking idiot. <laughs> but um, like it's that confusion was part of the fun, and I loved seeing everyone going like, "What's actually happening?" And then you could see the few comic bands were the ones that were silent because they were just in stunned disbelief, jaw on the grounds. And looking back and then there's a lot more implications uh, to what was said in that and that they went in a different direction. But that confusion is supposed to be good. Even like in the first Iron Man movie, Nick, Nick Fury shows up at the end and people just go, who's he? Yeah. And I, even some of the comic fans at the time, because in the Ultimates universe, uh, Samuel Jackson was the basis for Nick Fury. But in the, the Marvel, the 616 universe, We've got uh, it. It was the David Hasselhoff, Nick Fury. You know, like this, this, this white guy with, like, you know, Silver Fox. So that confusion is good. So why wasn't that scene in Secret Invasion used as the post credit scene? Going, yeah. what's actually happening here? Everyone goes to the mess board. Everyone goes to Wikipedia. Everyone starts trolling through their comics again. Missed opportunity again. So actually, the name of this episode was Home. Can we change the missed opportunity? This is a lot more accurate. <laughs> Yeah. I, like literally because it would have been so much more powerful as yeah. a post credit scene because and, and again I guess if if they had to argue I don't know I'm putting words in their mouth now but they probably say well that'd be a commitment into doing something in the future and we're not sure if we're going to come back to this or whatever and it was really based on the success of the project how many Marvel post credit scenes have we seen that just nev- nothing ever came of it and how many more do we have outstanding like even the Eternals I don't I'm not sure we're going to see Harry Styles again in the MCU but we saw you know what I mean like it's just there it's a possibility and that's that's what's fun and it's just left open Um, so it's yeah so long for Adam Warlock and of course knowing that the Infinity Saga was in full swing the Infinity Stones are coming Thanos was established and then they announced Adam Warlock's name and it's Adam Warlock was a key player in the Infinity Gauntlet storyline after Thanos was defeated by the Celestial Forces, Adam got, Adam Warlock was trusted with the Infinity Gauntlet. So we're like, oh, this is going to be good, this guy, and then we don't see him till Guardians 3. Mm. And I, it was just like, you know, I never thought, okay, Adam Warlock's just not happening, and then he just shows up. A uh, very different character to who he is in the comics. And like you said, the Harry Styles thing, even the one that I keep coming back to is, we know Blade is, is coming as a movie. Yeah. But we haven't heard anything more about the Black Knight. Mm. So unless that's going to tie into Blade itself, uh, it just it oh. seems like some of them don't go anywhere. But that's okay because that's the fun. it's a bit of fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. it is. It's, it's the part of it. Like, let us think, maybe we'll see it. Maybe it'll turn into something. And if it doesn't, that's fine. We won't care. But like, yeah, give us something to be hyped about. Like, and they just opted not to. It was, it was an insult. Um. Okay, that's where we kind of land on the series itself and the episode. I kind of want to, it's great, I think, to kind of take stock on this. Like I said, we're in our ninth iteration, ninth series of it. We're coming into our 10th series, which is also the first ever season two we're going to get in Loki. And by the way, a bit of news right here, we are going to be covering it once we finished up with Ahsoka. Uh, So Dan will be back uh, and we will be talking through Loki, which will take us also through the Marvels as well. So loads of uh, of Marvel chat still to come uh, this year on page one. 180 but before we wrap up i kind of want to check in and see where does this fall how are your marvel tv show rankings uh looking after this okay so i am going to my tv rankings are a bit of a hot take because okay. i still i'm going to put uh, falcon winter soldiers number one i like that a lot it was a love letter to the 80s action movies mm-hmm. with a modern uh, ethical twist i really really enjoyed that because it was the first one and there was so much of that speculation. And watching that week to week was really fun. Number two is going to be one division. Loki is going to slip in just behind that. And the reason why I'm putting Loki so low and most people are high, people are going to be like, what is he talking about? I just, that element of the MCU sometimes, that uh, psychedelic kind of space opera, is just in the comics was not something I madly enjoyed. And I think my... Uh, lack of excitement for the series coming into it is what kind of hurt that. I understand people love Tom Hiddleston's Loki, mm. but as a Thor fan myself, and Loki being such an irritating character in the comics, not in like in the charming way that Hiddleston turned it around, um, a lot of the the pre the, the, the factors that led up to Loki just weren't getting me as excited for as I was, and that's the only reason why I'm going to put that lower. Mm-hmm. Secret Invasion, 
as much as I hate it, it like to say it, it's probably going to take the bottom spot for me right now. Really? Because I, I enjoyed watching it, but there was nothing about it that brought like the excitement that any of the other shows did. Mm. Okay, interesting. I'll go through mine. I've got One Division one. I think One Division was the last time Marvel had a complete trust. Um, I know people weren't mad about the ending, and I get it, and it kind of goes back to the discussion we had about this finale. Um, but I thought they had our complete trust and it took us in ways that we weren't expecting in the way that Marvel just don't do these days. And I feel like that harkens back to it. Number two, I feel would be the one that people will see as controversial. Um, but I, I she hulk is my second favorite. Um, I loved this because it felt like its own project. It felt ballsy. It marched its own beat and tune. It didn't try to be a Marvel TV show. It was just a a procedural comedy. Uh, And I really liked that. And a lot of cool, like even just bringing Daredevil in as like a recurring Mm. character as well. And then the ending was just like possibly the best ending of any series. Speaking of great endings, I also have Loki at number three. Um, Again, I feel that Loki... It, it had the amazing ending, the la- last episode, maybe the best episode of Marvel TV. Um, But I feel that the last episode does a lot of heavy lifting. I felt that the show never fully felt grounded, um, which kind of hurt for me. It felt a bit random and a bit jumping around and uneven week to week. But on the plus side of it, I felt it did a really, really good job at simplifying and making the multiverse easy to understand and consume, which has been very important in the subsequent projects since. Um, mm-hmm. Hawkeye, I have at number four, which is uh, for very similar reasons as She-Hulk. Just felt very like its own project, very charismatic, very charming, uh, and just a fun TV show as well that I feel of all episodes worked, um, even if it wasn't set in the world ablaze or kind of, you know, getting everyone talking in the same way WandaVision did. Of what if in number five, um, because I just loved some of the concept at the highs there were some really like fucked up concepts that we've never seen Marvel kind of go to like Doctor Strange getting left in eternity by himself forever uh, the zom- Marvel Zombies as well which is obviously getting spun off into its own project um, the highs were amazingly high Falcon and Winter Soldier I have in at number 6 but actually your love of this makes me want to go back and watch it and see if I appreciate it more just w- having kind of talked about you with it so I am going to do that uh, I miss Marvel in at 7 there were a lot of positives in there Um. I, but again, like it kind of fell apart towards the back end of the season. But I do like Kamala. I think she was a great addition. I think her family and kind of the first half of it and when it set up her world, I thought it was like, I, I originally thought I was going to like it as much as I ended up liking She-Hulk. Uh, it just kind of fell apart towards the end. But I think, again, a lot of wins in there. I've Secret Invasion in second bottom uh, and Moon Knight in last because I just thought Moon Knight was an absolute train wreck. And I, to be honest, I forget it exists until I have to look this up. And I'm like, oh yeah, Moon Knight was a TV show that I really yeah. And, and begrudged watching every single week um, so that's where I'm going to lay it anyway for the time being though these are always subject to change uh, we're I, have say, I always forget to include uh, what if not because I forget or didn't enjoy that felt like its own thing I know yeah, it was yeah. a TV show but what if I was just the what if com- I guess that's where I'm coming from the what if comics felt separate to yeah. the continuous storyline so i need to start throwing that in a bit more because i i leave that it like there's tv show the movies the shorts and then what if is its own thing yeah so i'm gonna start really like really trying to think about getting that in somewhere as well because okay, interesting it. interesting guys send us on your rankings as well we want to know what how do you feel about this have we got it wrong are there any secret invasion fans out there who are like this is actually the best show and here's why we'd love to hear it because like we've kind of proven throughout this week and including like and the previous weeks um we want to be positive about this and we want to be optimistic even if it takes us 20 years to like this show we will wait uh, but then it has been a lot more easy to kind of see the benefits and see the positives of the show and enjoy it uh, by chatting to you every single week week on here so i cannot wait to do it more with loki and hopefully i feel that and i i feel that we will get a better content to be able to kind of discuss and we won't be ragging on it every single week but absolute pleasure thanks for joining us here on page 180 follow dan on socials if you haven't already uh, but in the meantime dan chat to you soon absolute blast